Well, like it or not, everything must change. There is transformation in our lives all the time. We can try to hold on to things. We can create marble statues of people. And sure enough, we can have those marble statues of people for, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000 years, maybe longer if they're taken care of properly. But I, well, have been watching television shows this, this last week on archaeology, and I noticed that there's noses broken off. Four fingers snapped off. These beautiful ancient marble statues, even they change over the years. Whether it's through vandalism or just wear and tear or gravity or who knows what, things change. Of course, things a lot more malleable than marble statues, they change. Ideas change. Traditions change. Thoughts change. One of the great grievances in Scripture, we read over and over again in the Old Testament as we find, well, then there came a generation that, got, that did not know so and so. Joseph, for example, and then came a generation that did not know Joseph. Then came a generation that did not know, and the Hebrew people, they go through this cycle, it seems, of obedience and disobedience because they forget who they are and they forget God. Seems like it's just part and parcel of the human condition, this idea and reality of change and transformation. But yet change and transformation can also bring good things. If you look at history, you think about the kings of the Dark Ages or the Medieval Ages that had to hold on to their power through sword and law that could crush others into the dust. Why, those, those poor guys and gals didn't even have air conditioning. They couldn't even pull a cream pie out of their refrigerator that they bought at Kroger for $4.50 on sale. They didn't have it all that great. Well, maybe not four fifty dollars anymore, but they didn't have it all that great. And you think about compared to how we have a lot of luxuries today. You've probably heard me say before that the average person back in Jesus' day didn't travel more than 30 miles from the town in which they were born. They just couldn't do it. It just wasn't part of their world. And today, you and I, we hop in a car and we drive 30 miles to go shopping. Oh, you got to go to the store that I heard about or that I love to go about. We think nothing of driving 30 miles to go to a restaurant or a store that we really like and really enjoy. Or maybe church, too. I know we have some church members that can drive quite a distance to get here on a cold January morning. So transformation is not all bad. Change is not all bad. And we see transformation and change in all three of our lessons today. All three of our lessons touch on this idea of transformation and change. Uh, national transformation in our first reading, but personal transformation in our gospel and in our second reading for today. Let's go to our first reading. Isaiah 62. You notice we're getting through the book of Isaiah now. If you've been coming to church regularly, you know that we've, we're, in, we're in the lectionary, and, and so we've been reading our way through Isaiah. And Isaiah is one of those odd books in that Isaiah is, well, he's kind of like, he's kind of like yelling at the people on one hand about the fact that they've disobeyed God, but then as Isaiah progresses and we get later on in the book, we see that he starts to then lift up this incredible message of hope for the Israelite people. Trouble's coming, but it's not going to end there. So today from Isaiah chapter 2, excuse me, 62, we see message of transformation. Well, what has happened? <clears throat> I'm not going to recap the whole thing. Again, we've talked about it over the last few Sundays. If you've been here, Israel's been taken captive a number of times. They're about to be taken captive again. They turned away from the Lord, <clears throat> and the Lord has let them go their way, which includes wandering off and becoming lost. But look at what the message of Isaiah is today. 
talking about transformation. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, says the Lord. This is Isaiah prophesying for the Lord. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, <clears throat> and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. And what could that new name possibly be? Why even have that in there? If there isn't some kind of incredibly important message behind that verse. What could the new name of, of the mouth of the Lord give? Well, how about Jesus the Christ? How about Christianity? Something new is coming. There is a transformation. There will be a transformation in the people of God at a future time. You shall be called a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. And remember, Mary and Joseph didn't pick the name Jesus. God did. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus was named very deliberately. And that name carries the message of salvation. Remember, and I think sometimes we forget this, that we are grafted on to the branch or the trunk of the tree that is Israel, the Jewish people, right? If you have forgotten that, <clears throat> reread the book of Romans. Paul goes into great detail. You and I, we are the wild shoot. We, we, are, we are the wild branch that is grafted onto the house of Israel, not the other way around. And so as Christians, we can trace our roots back to Judaism. Judaism, however, transformed Judaism made into something new through the power of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ sits with his disciples and says, this is my body given for you, this is my blood shed for you, Jesus is taking a traditional Seder meal done at the time of Passover and transforming that into a Christian message. By the way, just so you know, here's a little, here's a little seed to plant in your brain. Uh, one of the Lenten services that we'll be doing, I get to talk about to Don about this. Sorry, Don, I'm springing this on you. But one of the Lenten services we're going to have is we're going to have folks that come in uh, and and show the Seder meal and how that ties in with Christianity. So that's that's a very neat thing you want to come and see. But this idea of transformation. Not just simply the Jewish people, not just one tribe anymore, but now the message of God opened up for all people, for all the world, which is the way it should have been in the first place, right? Because after all, God created all people in the world. Transformation of an entire identity of people. Let's go to our gospel lesson. I love our gospel lesson. I love it when this gospel lesson comes around. Because if, if you're not reading this with just a little tongue-in-cheek humor, you're not seeing it. I don't think you're seeing this. This is really quite a funny story. This is totally a story about transformation. And what it is, it's a, it's a story about the transformation of Jesus' identity. Who Jesus sees himself as, especially who other people see him as. Remember, you and I, we're, we're riding a knife's edge, right? When we think about Jesus the Christ, 100% God, but also 100% human. And I think when we think about Jesus as 100% human, we can get kind of nervous because then we have to understand the fallible nature, in a sense, that Jesus has temptations, but he's not fallible in that he fails. He succeeds every time. And avoids the temptation. But for the temptation and for the quandaries that he must face to be true, 100% human. That's what makes the price on the cross valid. Right? If it was some kind of spiritual ghost hanging up there on the cross that never had to worry about hunger or pain or frustration or tears or doubt, then the price wouldn't be enough. 
This is, this is old, old, old church doctrine that was settled in the first few centuries of the Christian church. This is nothing new. What do we see Jesus going through today? <sighs> How much do I honor my father and mother? Right? One of the laws, one of the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother so that your days are long in the land that the Lord your God will give you. And here we see Jesus in a dilemma. His ministry versus, well, shall we say, the ministry of his mother? What mom wants him to do? Let's kind of set the stage here a little bit. Remember we talked about the 12-year-old Jesus? The one who stayed behind in the temple? Remember a few weeks ago we talked about Jesus who stayed behind and they looked high and low for him and finally found him in the temple? And Jesus says, well, where else would I be? I'm in my father's house. But then in Luke chapter 251, and he went to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. That's the 12-year-old Jesus. He's obedient to his parents. He does what they tell him to do. Now I'm going to jump ahead. Let's contrast that to another Bible verse. Matthew chapter 12 or Luke 8. And so here we're jumping six chapters ahead in Luke. And now I'm doing this for a purpose. Before our gospel and after our gospel. His mothers and his brothers come looking for him. And they're worried about it because they think that mentally he might be a little off. Jesus might be a little off because he, he's left the, the family business of carpentry. And he's out doing all kinds of crazy things. All these miracles and whatnot and speaking like a rabbi. And, and so mom and the brothers come to get him. And what does Jesus say? He says, well, who are my mothers and my brothers? Here is my mother, and here are my brothers. And Jesus, in Luke chapter 8, six chapters later, says, whoever does the will of God is my mother and my brother. Hmm. That's quite a transformation. Today, smack dab, John chapter 2, right in the middle of all of this. I think this is a cute story, and it just shows... The human condition. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. Don't push me, Mom. It's not time yet. Does Mom listen? No, she turns to the servants and she says, Do whatever he tells you. And I almost imagine her walking away in a huff. And so Jesus has a choice, doesn't he? Do I go ahead and do I, do, I, do I dare perform my first public miracle and have it be turning water into wine? Really? Uh, well, he does. He listens to his mother. He obeys the Ten Commandments. And he turns the water into wine. And we have the first public miracle of Jesus on record in John chapter 2. But you can see the transformation. All of us have to go through that. If you think back to your parents, right? You, you, I'm sure that came, that came that time when you just, no, Ma, I can't do it. No, Dad, I can't do it. You know, my husband, my wife needs me. My kids need me. I'm sorry. I, I just, you, or maybe not. But it's interesting to see the transformation anyway, isn't it? Because later on, Jesus, in Luke chapter 8, just says, Who's my mother and brothers? These folks are. Well, let's go to our final, uh, the final reading that I want to pay attention to today, and that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is about our transformation. Who are we as people? Who are we as children of God, but also brothers and sisters in a common mission together in this Christian church? This thing that is called by the new name. Remember Isaiah 62? You shall be called by a new name that the Lord, the mouth of the Lord will give. And we read about these gifts. And today I don't want to concentrate on the gifts specifically as much as we've all been blessed with them. We have all been blessed with a gift of some kind. God has worked a transformation in our lives. And I would dare say 
that as our lives progress, as we get older, our gifts might even change. They might transform into something different. This last week, I was at Lutheran Hillside Village. Pastor Pat Monroe uh, is, has been away to take care of his son who injured himself uh, terribly, needing uh, neck surgery. And so I've been covering chapel services for him on Thursday. And I preached this sermon. And one of the things I said to them, and I say to you, although I think you've heard this message before, you are never, ever dealt out of the ministry of God through Jesus Christ. I don't care how old you think you are, or know you are. I don't care what you think you can do or can't do. There is always one thing at least you can do. And when I say at least, that even puts it in the wrong perspective. And that is lift yourself up in prayer to God. Pray for your church. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your families. Pray for all of those around you. It's, it may not be any more about gifts of healing or working with miracles or being able to give prophecies or discerning spirits or speaking in tongues or giving large amounts of money to the church. It may simply be someday about uttering prayers. Being a prayer warrior is a very powerful and incredible thing. It is the same God who activates all of them in everyone, these gifts. In various parts in our lives, or points in our lives, I should say we are called to serve in so many different ways. And if we ignore our ministry, if we ignore the gifts, we do so at our peril. Right? There's enough parables to remind us that the one who buries his talent in the ground and does nothing with it is the one that is punished. All these gifts activated by one and the same Spirit individually as the Spirit chooses. As the Spirit chooses. And therein comes the transformation. How can God use your talents and your skills today, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, however long from now? And use, not in a bad way, but for the glory of the kingdom and to show God's love in this world. Once again, transformation. Like it or not, the world changes all around us. Things fluctuate. They go up, they go down, they're this color, they're that color, they have this flavor and that flavor, they sound this way, now they sound that way. Just fill in the blank. It transforms, it changes, and that includes you, and it includes me. Are we going to transform to God's will so that God's will is done. Listen to the power of the Holy Spirit. It whispers ever so softly, but it does so with a very powerful voice and message. So listen and allow yourself to be transformed if that works the betterment of God's kingdom. Amen.